Welcome to Elevating Consciousness, the podcast that helps you discover deeper levels of truth, meaning, and wholeness. I'm your host, Artem Zen, and our guest today is a chaplain, educator, and author. He currently serves as a chaplain educator at Overlook Medical Center, where he runs the Clinical Pastoral Education Program. He's also the director and founder of the Institute of Spiritual Midwifery, which is dedicated to the development of the theory, praxis, and pedagogy of spiritual midwifery in the ministry of individuals, families, and organizations. His work in chaplaincy and his experience with cerebral palsy offer a unique and powerful perspective on the intersections of disability and spiritual caregiving. Through speaking engagements, educational initiatives, and personal interactions, he educates and inspires others to approach spiritual caregiving with a more inclusive and compassionate mindset. He's the author of several books, including The Art of Spiritual Midwifery, and most recently, Christianity and the Art of Wheelchair Maintenance. Stephen Fowler, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to meet you. This is uh, an insanely generous offer of yours, and I'm really thankful. I hope one day I can return the favor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, I, I think you've you've already uh, done your share with uh, all the work that you're doing and uh, and, and this book, um, which was kind of my introduction to you. And how did you find it? Yeah, so you know, I want to set a little bit of context. So I, I ran across uh, the art of spiritual midwifery. As it was one of the books recommended in John Verveke's new lecture series called After Socrates. I'm not sure if you're familiar with John Verveke. I'm not. Yeah. I'd, well, I'd like to be. But, yeah. Well, uh, we could chat more about him, but yeah, he's um, kind of a, he's a big figure in the, in the fields that I move around. And okay. Um, okay. He, yeah. So he has this whole lecture series called um, After Socrates, and he's really big on Dialogos. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, I, I, he mentioned that book and I just kind of picked it up and I, I really loved it. And, you know, I wanted to talk to you about it. That's exciting. Yeah. And, you know, and then I did some research about you and I learned about your disability, which made me want to talk to you even more since I've uh, been dealing with my own health condition for almost two years now. Talk and, to me. What are you yeah, dealing with? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'd love to actually explore that. And, um, and maybe we could come to that a little bit later whatever you say yeah yeah it's your show yeah <laughs> for sure um so i, I kind of wanted to start with kind of maybe a simple question or maybe it's a complex question what is spiritual midwifery yeah it's um hard to summarize it's really hard to summarize um <laughs> Because there's a lot of ways for me to answer that. I could answer the question, what is it to me? <clears throat> what has it meant to my life's work? I could answer the story of how it developed, how it came to be. Um, I could offer, you know, a technical definition. Um, what I would say is that... Uh, you know, uh, if you go to my website, um, or from Plato's Theotetus, where uh, Socrates kind of coins the term spiritual midwife, and he talks about um, helping another person with the understanding that the person the individual being helped and the divine have the most important roles. But it is possible to enter into that dyad as a helper. And the spiritual midwife is such a helper. So I hope that we'll continue to, to peel away the layers of what is a spiritual midwife. I'm not trying to be vague or coy. That's not my style. But I've lived with this probably for a little over uh, 20 years, about 23 years, 24 years. And when you live with uh, something that long and it's that spiritual for you, it's hard to summarize quickly. 
What do you think it is? You read the book. Yeah. Um, so the way that I was thinking about it, I was actually doing a summary of your book. And um, I, I, the way that I try to explain it was basically, or the way I was understanding it was that you're using the metaphor of the midwife to represent uh, a spiritual counselor or a transformational worker and spiritual midwifery is like a process in which the transformational worker uses presence and dialogue to help birth what is emerging in another's experience. No, I, I really like that. That's nice. It's succinct. Uh, and it's true. I think that, uh, you know, midwifery is uh, a medical metaphor and uh, as a discipline um, midwifery might be the last discipline that is uh, committed to well wellness and generativity all of the other disciplines are pathological meaning they focus on disease and disease processes. If you go to a, a renologist, they're, they're going to look at your kidneys. If you go to an oncologist, they're going to look at your cancer. Those are disease processes, but you encounter a midwife actually when things are going well when your body is doing what it's supposed to do and you're trying to bring forth new life. And uh, most people going through that process benefit from help. So there are plenty of bold and courageous women all over the world who give birth unassisted. <laughs> But probably more than nine times out of ten, if they're given a choice, they prefer to have help. And the spiritual midwife is that kind of third-party helping person. Um, you know, Socrates, in that dialogue uh, by Plato, um, describes and defines the role of the um third person helper but I also found a lot of uh, embodiment of that uh, in the parables of Jesus out of my own tra tradition and um, you know Jesus doesn't talk about what it means to be a, a midwife but you kind of see uh, the character of Nicodemus struggling with that paradox. Uh, he asks rather pointedly, how can I be born again? What does that even look like? Do I have to find my mom? What am I going to do here? Like, how do I even do this? And so uh, it's a holy mystery, but I think these luminaries of philosophy and religion and it's a path that I've really enjoyed understanding, deepening following and I love it yeah you, there's actually a lot in the book where you speak about Jesus and Socrates as being these kind of major sources yeah. um, that represent the metaphor yeah, of, of spiritual yeah. And, midwifery. You know, I I think it's interesting that they both gravitate toward this language um, as being male. Uh, I've had some male readers say, you know, your your book kind of gives me the cooties, and I don't want to read it. It's about women stuff, and I've had women read it and say. Hey, are you appropriating something that really belongs to women? But without of any kind of blush or hesitation, uh, both Socrates and Jesus find life 
and purpose in this metaphor. And uh, I think I'm in good company <laughs> to uh, use it myself. Yeah, and, you know, it seems to me that at the heart of spiritual midwifery is dialogue and dialectic. And maybe we can explore how dialogue in spiritual midwifery is different than a typical everyday conversation. What are some of the principles that guide this way of conversing with somebody? Um, I think that oftentimes in a casual conversation, um, the the locus of gravity is oriented toward the mutual reduction of anxiety. So if you if you pass someone and they say, "Hey, what's up?" you try and say something natural. You're trying to avoid awkward, and that kind of anxiety reduction mechanism really guides every every exchange. What are you doing? Not much. How about you? Not much. Cool. Peace out. See, see you later. And there are a thousand variations of that. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, uh, uh, suburbanites at the uh, local barbecue. Uh, there's still that mechanism. Here's what I'm doing. I want to I wanna brag a little bit, but I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. So I'm going to stay away from politics and religion, which are the only things I talk about. <laughs> I only talk about politics and religion. <laughs> and um, so that's kind of the social construct. And I think... Um, Psychoanalyst Eric Byrne talks a lot about this dynamic in his seminal work, uh, The Games People Play. And most people have this kind of uh, way of using dialogue essentially as a pastime, or even worse, a game, um, a transaction to get what you want, to mitigate the interaction. And to move on. Spiritual midwifery then is going to go perpendicular to that. It's going to want to gravitate towards meaning and understanding, uh, consciousness, and transformation. Yeah, that, you know, this, a lot of what you're kind of saying um, reminds me of. Um, well, what you're saying kind of reminds me of how people tend to converse. And then spiritual midwifery, this kind of more honest, uh, connected, meaningful way of dialoguing with somebody really reminds me of this practice that I do called circling. Wow. And Tell me about circling. Take me yeah, around the circle. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, circling is kind of, it's, it's concerned with um, what it's like to be here right now us two being here right now, what it's like to be here together and on the connection. Yeah. And, a, and a lot of times, you know, conversation is, it's us two talking about something else. Yeah. Where circling kind of brings you right to the knife's edge of what's here in the connection. And, and actually, I feel like this term, I've been hearing this spiritual midwifery term um, kind of in these spaces that I'm moving in. And, and, you know, there's the circling and, and it's intertwined with a lot of what John Verveke does. And he does, um, he does the dialogos practice. How then, is Verveke spelled? How do you spell that? It's um, V-E-R-V-A-K-E. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, it's V-E-R-V-A-E-K-E. -E, John Verveke. Okay. Yeah. So um, a lot of what he does with dialogos and he actually... Um, started working with Guy Sengstock. And Guy Sengstock is like the guy who first started the circling practice um, decades ago. Okay. And they're kind of integrating circling and dialogos. I actually had a chance to do one of their uh, one of their weekend courses before with this practice. But but yeah, it kind of there seems like there's a lot of resonance and there's a lot of this 
uh, movement towards this way of conversing and dialoguing, yeah. Yeah. Uh, at least in the spaces that I move in. Yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. You know, uh, you move, like you say, in certain circles long enough <laughs> and you pick up more and more clues, more and more names, more and more thinkers, and the pathway is never ending. So thank you for that name. Yeah, it's interesting. Actually, I just spoke to um, somebody else the other day and her book I also got from his lecture series. And she was also not aware of who John Ravicki is. But but it's like in, in the spaces that I move in, it's like, every, you know, everybody knows who he is. But I, I definitely think he's somebody to pay attention to. And yes, yeah. I, I think you'll find his work really interesting and you'll find a lot of resonance with it. So. I mean, I'm excited for that. Um, I've kind of left strictly um, academic circles because I think um, perhaps in the tightest of those circles, there's this tendency to go broader and broader and broader, and you could never go broad enough. You could circle the whole globe and you'll be accused of being a narrow reader. And I think what this circling uh, that you're describing wants us to do is not go broader, but go deeper. And so uh, without helpful people like yourself, it can be hard for me to get new names of people to dialogue with. Yeah, I'm glad to um, be kind of... um a catalyst for that and and provide that connection. And that's part of why I do this podcast is to introduce other people to thinkers like yourself and authors and, and, and um, speakers and people that are kind of exploring these different topics. That's um, very cool. Yeah. And, you know, can, can, I actually, the other question I had that's also related it to, to dialogue is um, this notion of dialectic. Can you speak on what dialectic is and, how it applies to spiritual midwifery. There's like, again, with all of your questions, there's about four or five points of entry each. Um, Dialectic is very etymologically akin to dialogue. Those words are very, very similar. Um, And in fact, uh, uh, the word uh, philosopher um, is a word that that we use uh, somewhat um, anachronistically to the Socratic tradition. He didn't call himself a philosopher. He called himself a dialectician, uh, somebody who likes to talk to people. Um, but within... Uh, the expansive course of Western philosophy, uh, especially with Hegelian dialectic, um, dialectic takes on uh, a unique meaning and function within philosophy. Um, And in the famous Hegelian dialectic, you have your thesis, and your antithesis, and then your synthesis, this kind of new thing. And and this is kind of a uh, philosophical recite about as organically or naturally as E equals MC squared. This is just one of those equations of life that everybody picks up. And... Um, so I think that a lot of that language uh, is cemented in Western thought around Hegel and those times, but it certainly uh, precedes Hegel. And in my own work, uh, I point heavily toward uh, Heraclitus, who echoes strangely of Lao Tzu and the Tao Te Ching, 
And when you talk about uh, what happens with opposites and between opposites and the interdependence of things that seem like they're different, but they're really two sides of the same coin, um, all that's dialectic, right? It's just dialectic kind of without the jargon of philosophy. So I think that then kind of touching on dialectic from a couple reference points in dialogue, um, hey, there's you uh, in your apartment and there's me in my basement and uh, the, this, there's a connection between us. What do we call that connection? One thing you could call it is dialectic. There's this kind of this new third thing between us that we've created. It wasn't here at uh, 1055, but it's here now. It's this kind of living uh, conversation where, where you might grow and I might grow. And, and even after we've long gone, whoever finds this podcast, like you and I could be long gone. We could end up on a submersive tomorrow. Uh, maybe that's too soon uh, at the bottom of the ocean. And, and um, you know, here, but this, this thing that we constructed lives on and changes things and has its own life. So uh, I think that dialectic is closely related to dialogue. Um, in my work, you know, I use the term playfully with uh, more than a wink and a nod toward Heraclitus. It's Heraclitus who is credited uh, with introducing uh, this philosophical term uh, logos to Western thought, logos, uh, which is the root of so many words, uh, logic being one of them. And, um, but it's also a powerful word in uh, the history of Christian theology. And uh, uh, John uh, was actually from Ephesus, where Heraclitus did his thing. <laughs> and uh, Heraclitus has this quote, uh, all things begin with the word. And, you know, 500 years later, John will start his gospel by saying, in the beginning was the word. It's practically a, a paraphrased quote. So um, I think this, this uh, reverence that Heraclitus had toward the Logos uh, lives on uh, in this tradition of, of midwifery and also in different spiritual and philosophical threads. Yeah, this, um, this aspect of dialectic, which is like, playing playing with opposites um yeah I, i've had this i have this little saying uh this little phrase uh which i would say kind of in my head sometimes and it's or just like this feeling oh like yeah i'm playing with paradox like i'm playing with paradox and it's it feels to me like dialectic has this kind of element it's like we're bringing things in and we're bringing you know your viewpoint and my viewpoint and yeah. we might be bringing opposing viewpoints, you know, yeah. and then seeing what emerges yeah. through integrating them. Well, this is this is uh, uh, embedded in the word paradox, and it's thoroughly a Greek construct. And the idea is that you've got at least tr two truths. That's the D-O-X, uh, from which we get things like uh, orthodox, or, or um, doxology, um, and uh, you've got two truths, and these two truths 
seem to be at odds with each other. So how does that work out? And you actually have that same kind of um, construction in the word parable. And uh, Jesus often constructs these rhetorical paradoxes and says, you know, there were two guys, uh, and one guy did this, and the other guy did the opposite. What's the right answer? <laughs> and so uh, the pair of bolts uh, are also an intentional uh, engagement of, of dialectic. This, these differences, these paradoxes, uh, all of this is intentionally in Jesus's uh, rhetorical um, heritage. Yeah, and I guess what comes up now is, is this this kind of, this playing with paradoxes or using parables, is, is it kind of done to shake up a people's sense of reality, to kind of pull them out from looking or being stuck in one way of looking? I mean, I definitely think that there's a lot of, of truth and application of what you just said. Uh, people um, have these static um, constructs where they cannot find themselves. And, and, and because they cannot locate themselves within their own static constructs, uh, you need to shake those up if you want to start moving again. So if I believe that um, God is someone I want to be in relationship with, but then I also say God is perfect and God has all these rules and I haven't been so good with the rules, <laughs> Well, then I feel discouraged. I can't even start. I can't even imagine a spiritual or a philosophical life for myself because I've kind of defined it as an impossibility for me or my tradition, you know. Um, and so what Jesus does intentionally is to destabilize those constructs and say, no, let me tell you the story about second chances. <laughs> and the individual was never thinking about second chances. So um, absolutely, uh, parables and paradox are ways to uh, use rhetoric to help people move beyond the uh, structures that they place themselves in or maybe their tradition has placed them in, religion of origin has placed them in, their birth religion, and uh, there are always new possibilities. So, yes. Yeah, and this is related to, uh, to parables, but one of the points that I found most insightful in your book is when you write Indirect communication is an authentic vehicle for dialogue. And I think for most of my life, I thought the opposite and really associated being direct with being authentic. Can you explain how indirect communication can be a vehicle for authentic conversation and in some cases, even a superior method to direct communication? <clears throat> well, direct communication has a number of... Um of presuppositions that go with it. You know, maybe uh, you got a pizza shop that you really like. Do you, do you like pizza? Who doesn't? <laughs> All right. I, I, I just wanted to check. You're the spiritual guy, and some, sometimes they can be unpredictable. So let's say you've got your pizza shop, and you're trying to tell somebody how to get to your pizza shop. Um, you can talk about that object objectively. 
You can say, get on this train, get, a, get off at this stop, make a left here, make a right there. And you, you know, you can navigate someone objectively because where the pizza shop is, is inherently objective. Uh, the spiritual life, however, is inherently subjective. So I have my spiritual life, you have yours, and us growing and deepening is not the same as us trying to get to the same external location. So already, you know, you have assumptions about what it is you're trying to communicate and um, that, that don't apply to this conversation at all. And, you know, maybe you learned that having an open mind is really important, but you learned that in your own way. And maybe you learned that in a, a painful way. You would never objectively say, well, you know, um, I had a closed mind until I dropped two tons on my foot. <laughs> And so what you need to do, friend, is do what I did. Go ahead and drop two tons on your foot. You know, you came to your spiritual wisdom through your own subjective path. So for me to try and answer your life's biggest questions, from my perspective, from my life, my path, it's not going to work. You know, there might be some general principles that are transferable, but my journey is mine. Yours is yours. And you can't mix them up like that. So I think a lot of times people want to communicate directly about things that are remarkably personal. And, and they don't understand why there's a disconnect. On the other hand, there are ways of sharing oneself that are raw and honest and vulnerable that don't involve these kinds of uh, uh, attempts. So I, I think that part of the problem is, is that Spiritually speaking, spirituality and the divine is bigger than all of us. Uh, maybe even bigger than all of us put together. So um, you can't talk about that like you can an arithmetic problem. Nobody has the perspective that you would need. So we think we're communicating, but uh, it didn't work so well. Yeah, this this actually, um, everything you're saying is kind of feeding into like the next thing that I wanted to bring up and um, this notion of subjectivity versus objectivity. And you speak about this um, a lot in your book. Uh, you write a lot of interesting things about um, this this dichotomy and I think in particular, this is important to me because I think in particular, um, people have this, I feel like people have the sense that there's, there's an objective reality. And if we all just get the facts right, people just don't have the right facts. If they have the right facts, yeah. then we can, you know, we could find what, what is true. Yeah. And I, I you know, I think you kind of, you talk a lot about in your book, how like facts, that's not, we're not arguing about facts. Yeah, I don't think that we can um, argue about facts in that kind of way. Um, a fact is really something that is not open to, to dispute. You know, you, your life was never made better by meditating on the fact that two plus two equals four. It doesn't touch you, it doesn't speak to you, it doesn't inspire you. Um, 
So I think that, yes, especially when a lot of people do want to enter into spiritual conversation, they think that talking about the dogma uh, of their tradition, which is a kind of fact, like it is a fact that Catholics believe X, Y, and Z, and that Jews believe A, B, and C. Those are kinds of facts. But talking about those facts is just as fruitless as talking about any other fact. Um, where the spirit moves subjectively. So, for example, um, there's this story that um, Itzhak Perlman, do you know who he is? I'll say who he is uh, in case there's someone watching the podcast who, who doesn't know. He's um, a, a great violinist um, with uh, polio. Uh, so he, you know, he's known as being a disabled violinist. And one night he's giving a concert, I think it's at the Met, and he, you know, walks out to the center of the stage um, because when you're a violinist at that level, you can have the center of the stage all by yourself. And he walks out there and he sits down and he uh, pulls out his violin to get it ready for the concert and um, a string breaks. It's the unmistakable sound of a string breaking. And everybody has just seen this guy labor to get out here. Took him 10 minutes to get in position. And now a string breaks. What's going to happen? And the audience gasps and courageously he um, motions his bow to the orchestra conductor, telling him, no, 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 you guys go ahead. Uh, I'm going to improvise. And using the strings that he has left, he creates all of the notes that he would have needed to make. Uh, if he had all four strings going. And then uh, after his performance, without missing a note, he says, uh, sometimes it is the job of the artist to see what you can do with what you have left. That's the story. And I've shared with you something that touches me. I haven't told you what I had for breakfast. I haven't told you where I live. But I've shared with you a piece of wisdom. I think what's really funny is if you go over to Snopes.com, I think Snopes.com will say that this is not even true. This is a made-up little piece of inspirational whatever. Um, but it's not actually true. This never happened. I think that's what Snope says. But we've talked about an idea, an idea that governs my life. It's, it's even fictional. It's not even real. But it touches on something that I want to live by, something that you want to live by, and it becomes a parable unto itself. Yeah, yeah, I like how you told that and brought in that it's a fiction at the end. And um, I'm I've been reading um, I've been reading James Hillman. I'm not sure if you're familiar with James Hillman, but uh, he talks about uh, he's like a young in psychologist, and he was really big on uh, the imagination. And, and he talks about this this notion of um, that that we've like we've lost touch with the imagination, and we take everything literally. And it, it seems like there's actually there's so much important in this imagination, and it's it's really un like what like what is real is also unclear, you know, because it's like you can tell it this is not quote unquote objectively real, or it doesn't necessarily like the story you told doesn't necessarily have to be a fact, but it's a real experience that people have. It has the ability to move people and direct people and guide yeah. people, even though yeah. it's not concrete or it's an objective fact. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, one could argue that the um, Marvel movies have moved more and achieved more than ever thought possible. If you talk about in terms of the sheer amount of dollars produced and, um, you know, we refer to this scene or that scene, it's become our, our conceptual matrix. We think of things and we reference this movie or, or that movie, but they're not real. So what is that? Uh, it's subjective. These movies touch at something that's subjective. And we want that and we need that. To some degree, we've learned how to monetize that. Um, so I'm just trying to illustrate uh, that, yes, there are facts. You know, I don't live with my head in the clouds. The facts themselves are very uninspiring. They just are. Um, and many of them might even be beyond my comprehension. Um, or, or perhaps even um, a function of consciousness itself. I'm sorry. Um, my phone is doing something. I'm having a um, wheelchair problem, and someone is calling me to try to help me with my wheelchair problem, which uh, is another fact that is not inspiring. <laughs> Comes crashing in. Sorry, I was muted there. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I you're bringing up the wheelchair thing, and I I, I want to speak about that too. Yeah. And um, but maybe before we go into kind of disability health, um, may, like say somebody is kind of in this kind of space where they want to be a spiritual counselor or yeah. a transformative worker, and they want to engage in this kind of process of spiritual midwifery. What are some barriers to spiritual midwifery? What are some things to avoid when engaging with someone in this process? Well, um, I think that when you're trying to take out the process for yourself and to make it a part of you and to really learn how to do it um, or to experiment with it, I think that Role is a very important role, R-O-L-E. And um, when I am functioning at the hospital as a hospital chaplain, I have a role. I have been authorized to function in a certain way. And there are things that I do and things that I don't do in accordance with that role. I don't stay in touch with my patients. Um, you know, we don't keep in touch. And um, when they leave the hospital, by and large, our relationship has come to an end. Um, I don't fraternize with my students. We don't go out for drinks uh, and things like that. So there are... are limits to the role and having a clear role and um, give you something to stand on when you're trying a new skill like if you're trying to learn a new skill and you're in an undefined role it's just too uh, overwhelming and disorganized and you're not sure um, what is in accordance with a midwife and what is not. You know, so a lot of times people try to enter into these. For example, in relationships that are deeply set, 
like with old friends or old family. And I would say that that's probably a mistake because uh, those people already love you a certain kind of way. And if you go up on them and change the role and take away the best friend, the little brother, whoever you were to them before, it's going to be really painful for everybody involved. So um, I think that role is actually a great way to um, begin learning the work. And at the risk of saying too much, which is my MO, I'll just stop there. Yeah, you're open. You're open to to say more. This is uh, yeah. This is a place for you to speak as much as you like. <laughs> I mean, so I'd, I'd say roll and um, maybe uh, a mentor, a, a guide. Um, you will find yourself with new problems and new challenges that you haven't thought through, and it will be helpful to have a Sherpa of sorts who's traveled these altitudes and knows where things are. Yeah. Well, you're somebody who's, who's done this for a while. So what, what are some maybe big problems or challenges that um, you've come across? Related to what? Spiritual midwife. I, like I was assuming- learning it or, or, well, which, it or, yeah, well, what challenges were you talking about when you were saying that they would come across challenges? Uh, I was assuming it would be uh, yeah. in the actual work. Well, yeah. So, um, as you help people move through the difficult places of their lives, the constricted places of their lives. Things are constricted because they're often painful. Like those two things are very much synonymous. They're constricted because they're painful and they're painful because they're constricted. Um, So you are going to be privy to the suffering of another uh, as you encounter the suffering of another in a real way uh, when you circle around someone else's suffering you are going to come up against all of your own suffering and if you haven't done that before you will encounter many firsts. I didn't know I was so, um, you know, bereft by my father's death. I didn't know I was so uh, troubled by the details of my own childhood. And so you're there, you're trying to serve this other person, and out of nowhere, you are flooded with thoughts and feelings completely unrelated to this person. That would be a challenge. Yeah. So like what I'm hearing you say is that often other people's difficulties can be kind of mirrors to our own difficulties and our own challenges. And it's psychoanalytically, the term for this is countertransference. Where you know what's happening in the life of someone else stirs stirs up all kinds of unresolved feelings and losses for for you. Yeah, um, or even things that you didn't even know might be a loss. Like maybe I don't know much about your personal life, Artem. Maybe you have children. Maybe you don't. Do you have children? Yes, I have two boys. Okay. Two, so, yeah. so like, all right, let's say um, someone is trying to start this off that does not have children. And someone else 
kind of gave up on life and went in when her child died. Um, perhaps this midwife in training, who isn't even a parent, didn't even think that would be a thing. <laughs> I didn't even think you could lose your cat. Uh, and so you discover many harsh realities and reactions that you didn't even know you had. And, um, you know, there were probably, there were probably many more, but there were four tools of the spiritual midwife that I was able to delineate from your book. And these included irony, negation, inductive logic, and, and the center. And I was wondering if you could maybe explain uh, what each of these are or how they work in the context of spiritual midwifery. Um, also, maybe unpacking all four would take too long. So maybe you could choose one or two that feel most alive for you to speak on now. Um, maybe, I should have yeah. pulled a copy of, of my book with me um, before uh, we sat down together. Um yeah, I, f I feel like you don't need it. I feel like you live. I feel like you live a lot of this stuff. So I I do, but yeah. there are some questions that I would want to refer to. Um, you know, I I wrote the book into three sections, and one section, section one, is really about the key metaphors involved, and I describe the metaphor of the midwife the metaphor of, of the babe, baby, and then the metaphor of the medicine that the midwife would administer. Um, and that's really all section one. Section two is um, a lot into the... Um, kind of the philosophy behind midwifery and wrestling with that philosophy helped me understand how it worked and then when i understood kind of the mechanism of it and how it works in a functional sense that gave me some insight onto what it was trying to do uh so you know, form follows function, and function reveals purpose. So um, I put all that stuff in section two. Most of my students get stuck on section two because it is its most abstract and uh, theoretical of the whole project. Um, and in that sense, um, I kind of kitchen sinked it when I wrote the book. I put in everything I had discovered along the way, because at the time, I thought it was going to be the last book I ever wrote. So like, you know, when you think, well, I might not come this way again, let me put everything in there. Um, so could you tell me, are you able to tell me in order chapters four, five, six, seven, and eight? I would think that chapter four is um, direct communication and indirect communication. That's what I talk about there. Uh, and then from there, I would go to um, probably negation. And then from there, I would go to irony. And chapter nine is the chapter on center. Did I hit that right? What's four, five, six, seven, eight? Yeah, give me a sec. I'm actually looking at the notes right now. Thank uh, you. Four, four is the how and the what yeah. it was called. And then. And then let's see, five yeah. is the the is uh, the pangs of S Socratic irony. Okay. And then, 
and then six is seduction, surrender, and negation. And negation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. So um, these are nested chapters, which means you have to read chapter four to make sense of chapter five, and you have to read chapter five to make sense of chapter six, uh, and so on. Um, so um, I had more uh, abstract um, titles for these chapters in an earlier draft. And when it came to publication, I wanted the chapter titles to be more vivid. Um, so chapter four is about the how and the what. And um, what I really wanted to suggest in that chapter is that what you are trying to communicate is going to influence how you do it. And I think that people that are beguiled by direct communication, and they think that you can talk about everything under the sun as if it were a fact, they don't see the difference between the how and the what. They think there's only a what. Um, but, you know, uh, certain spiritual truths um, are not tethered to facts, as we've dis discussed, and um, we can share them, and we might need to look at how does my um, style of communication um, influence the point I'm trying to get across. And at the beginning of that chapter, I quote the Apostle Paul, who is basically saying, I could be 100% correct on all the doctrine, but if I come across like a jerk, <laughs> I've lost everything. And so what he's saying there is that there really is an important connection between uh, the what and the how. And I think in the materialism that reigns supreme in our culture, there's only the what. Uh, there's no thought given to the how whatsoever. Once you understand that there is a how and a what, dialectically, a relationship emerges between them. Um, is this style of expression suitable for the message being communicated? And that relationship is called irony. And, um, you know, Socratic irony is hard to explain, especially quickly. Um, well, what I would say... If I could interject. Yeah. I, I, I think a great way to speak about irony is kind of the example of Socrates' death. Maybe that's like a great thing that you could... Uh, well, uh, say some more and tell me what you're thinking. Um, yeah, it was just the way the way that he Socrates went out, the way that he died was... It's 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 like his death was like an exclamation point for like everything that he stood for. Yeah, right, right. So, you know... Ironically, if what the Athenian government is trying to do is shut him up and to use his death to shut him up, um, he was able to use his own death to be louder than ever. Um, so, you know, um, in that sense, you could say that Socrates was able to man manipulate the irony so that he could continue to uh, communicate the message and values that he wanted to convey. Um, so, you know, when you find that um, there is this, like... 
this middle thing, this dialectical middle thing. It's not the how, and it's not the what. It's the relationship between the how and the what. That, to be a more effective communicator, I can use that to help people overcome whatever they're trying to overcome. Um, so that becomes another tool. And trying to think how negation dovetails directly to irony, I think that you have to understand the uh, relationship between the how and the what to begin to appreciate negation. And with negation, um, this is not how we uh, typically offer help. We say, I'm an expert. I have the answers. I have the resume. Uh, I'm a cheerful person. Uh, I'm going to cheer you up because I'm so friendly. I'm so wise and so, you know, holy that I'm going to help, help you out and make your life better just by hanging out with you. That is not what needs to happen. Um, you know, that person has to face a difficult spiritual task in themselves. You know, maybe they have to grieve. Maybe they have to mourn. Maybe they have to face fears. I don't know what they have to do, but it's difficult. Sometimes it's as difficult as death itself. Sometimes a person has to die. I can't cheer someone up or make their death better because I was nice to them. How arrogant is that? So negation says, okay, what I need to do is I need to interact with this person as to not become a distraction, but help them do what they need to do. You know, is this person um, going to be helped out because I shared my life story? I gave all my pearls of, of wisdom or because I was there, able to be there in a way that helped them face whatever fears they had. Being light is like um, crack in this culture. You know, we all want the button pushed. We want to be liked. We, we want people to subscribe. Um, everybody wants that like. Everybody wants that Facebook like. Um, and that is probably the most addictive substance uh, in the world today, um, is being liked. And negation says being liked is actually not the most important thing. Being useful <laughs> <laughs> is the most important thing. And if I have to go and do all the things I have to do to get you to like me, I might not do my best by you to be useful. So that's kind of how negation fits in there. And <clears throat> after those sections in chapter nine, I talk about the center. And the center is kind of this um, perspective that the midwife operates from where there is both balance and disequilibrium. So, um, because if there's no disequilibrium, there's no movement. And if there's no disequilibrium, it's static 
and fragile. You know, if I'm so fragile that you can mess up my peace, then I'm not going to be very resilient or resourceful. You might say the wrong thing and now I'm all upset. So there has to be some kind of space for being off balance. At the same time, it's a very grounded space, the center. And you have to be grounded because you are watching and supporting people do hard things akin to giving birth. If you can't hear the screams of a woman, don't become a midwife. You've got to be okay with that. So, and I thought the center is actually the shortest chapter in the whole book. It's probably about six pages. And um, it doesn't need to say a whole lot. Yeah, I um, I really liked what you were speaking about the center. And for me, the way that I was tying it back to my life, it kind of reminded me of what in meditation practice is often called equanimity. And equanimity is a kind of a place where you know you're in equanimity in meditation because, you know, you might be start meditating and you might start having different thoughts that mm. bother you, right? Like the thoughts yeah. will pull you away. They distract you or there's unpleasant thoughts that you don't want to have. And you notice as you get calmer in meditation, you get to this place of equanimity. You can have those same thoughts or you, or you can think about any like a problem in your life, right? What, yeah. Something that's usually a problem, but you think about it and it actually doesn't bother you. It actually doesn't take you off center. So you have this sense of equanimity. So yeah. that, that kind of really reminded me of that. I'm place. really connecting with what you're saying <clears throat> right now. A lot of uh, chaplaincy students will say to themselves, well, I'm their religious professional, so I can't be scared in the patient room. And when you put up that kind of uh, law for yourself that you can't be scared, you, you now have unthinkable thoughts. <laughs> and what do you do if you think one of these unthinkable thoughts? you run out of the out of the room and so what someone who meditates or someone who attends suffering does is they have to say okay there might be a new uncomfortable thought i've never encountered before and maybe that will be more of a distraction than i would like but it's okay there's room for even my imperfection and by allowing that room, when those thoughts do come, you can find your center very quickly. Here's that thing I don't want to think about. There it is. It's not going to freak me out. It's not the end of the world. And it has less and less power. But once we say, I can't feel this way, I can't think that way, I can't have these ideas, that's a very fragile place. And you're not going to be very effective if, you, if you're that guarded. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's a lot of the things you're saying, these are very useful tools, especially the, one, another, the other thing that stood out for me was the whole how and the what. And uh, I have to admit, like in my life, I've been often like very direct and very concerned with the what and like kind of just drilling down and overlooking the importance of the how. And I think recently I'm really tuning into that, like, well, it's the tonality of how you say it and it's how you approach it. And it's, it, you know, it's not just what you say, but it's the manner in which you say it. I think that's really important. And I think at the end of the day, um, the how might be more impactful in the world. Like we have our various what's, um, but it's really in the how. And, you know, because Socrates was a master of his own how, we're still talking about him today. <laughs> uh, 
twenty twenty five hundred years later. Um, so I think there's just a tremendous power in that how, which is often overlooked for short-sighted reasons. Yeah, so I, I think right now uh, would would be a good place to kind of get into the disability health thing. And, um, you know, this is something that I've been meaning to talk about on my podcast. And, you know, I've, I've wrote about it a little bit in, in my newsletter and, you know, all the people in my life that are close to me know about it. But um, in, in August 2021, so almost two years ago, I had COVID which created an adverse reaction in my body. And it seems to have damaged my spine. And that led to impaired sensation and strength in my lower body and ultimately made it very difficult to walk. And I always kind of pictured, you know, for the last almost two years, I kind of pictured, I thought I'd share this story after I recovered. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do all this stuff and I'm gonna recover and I'm, you know, the hero's journey and I'm gonna come out and, you know, it's it's been a while. It's um, it's been you know almost two years, and it hasn't really improved much. I've done a lot of different stuff. I've done a lot of physical therapy, uh, alternative treatments, a lot of stuff, uh, and there hasn't been much improvement. And um, you know, just to kind of speak on how it kind of impacts me, like I'm able to walk, <laughs> just not well, and uh, I you know I could walk. My, my balance is impaired, right? So like my balance is impaired. I can't, um, you know, there's difficulty, especially with my little one. Like I wouldn't be able, I can't, I wouldn't be able to like go to, go to the day, their daycare and pick up my little one by myself. Like I would need help, at least somebody to bring him to the car because it, even that like I carry him at home, I can't really carry him on the street because I could, I could easily trip. Like I fell a lot of times and like I'm very unstable um, and yeah. I can relate. I can yeah. relate. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and and before this, I was, my whole life, I was just um, very healthy, very physically active in the gym all the time, yoga all the time, probably one of the healthiest people I knew. And kind of, you know, all, all my friends uh, were like super shocked. Like, cause, like, I'm like, I'm like the healthiest one. I'm like the one that everybody would look up to in terms of health and taking care of himself. And, yeah, and it's, um, I guess the way I've been dealing with it is, you know, there's been waves of grief where it's like, um, you know, the way I see it is there's kind of these two sides of the coin and one side, one side is hope and an another side is fear. And it seems like whenever there's hope, fear is close by. And so it's like, I hope I'm going to get better. And then there's like kind of a, a fear that I won't. And I've been kind of, trying to live in this in between space and just being present every day and just taking it day by day and trying to do what I can. Um, and, you know, I wanted to speak to you and, and I think this is a good episode for me to speak about this condition uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, your work with spiritual midwifery and also your own lifelong disability. Um, you've been dealing with the complications of cerebral palsy for most of your life. Which, all my life. Yeah, all your life. And, you know, that includes being wheelchair bound. And maybe you can explain kind of what cerebral palsy is, how it's affected you, have, how you've learned to deal with it, and also what advice or words you have for someone who is also dealing with a disability or a health issue such as myself. Well, I really want to thank you for sharing. And um, I want to acknowledge that what you're facing is hard. And I'm happy to share my situation. Um, I think that one of the things that's different between the two of us is that um, my disability is the result of a um, birth trauma. So I was injured during the birth process. And um, so my disability is not genetic. I was fine. I was born without diseases or anything like that. But I got a birth trauma. Uh, that alone is kind of interesting for someone who will eventually um, 
uh, claim spiritual midwifery <laughs> as his vocation. Uh, and I know how uh, trauma can go. Uh, but that said, I'm 50 years old now, and I've had decades of my life to um, make peace with what I have, what I can do, and what I don't have. And uh, two years ago is not long. <laughs> um, so, time to really wrestle with that. And um, that is a journey in and of itself. In, in my own tradition, um, you know, Jacob uh, wrestles with the angel all night long. And he doesn't let go until he gets a, a blessing. But he never walks the same way again. <laughs> ever but he has that blessing of being touched and he gets a new name and that's where the name Israel comes from one who wrestles with, with God uh, so sometimes it's the hero's journey of how does our hero overcome I think perhaps the greater journey is how does the hero endure? Um, so what my disability is, uh, is a birth trauma that has resulted in um, difficulty with my legs and my left arm and probably my right arm too although it's probably 80%. So I use it for everything. But if you were to ask me to do a fine motor skill, um, I would not feel confident. Like when I have to open up my laptop and change the hard drive or change the RAM, uh, I'm pretty nervous to, to go in there because I don't have the, the dexterity. Uh, one second. Um, I'm just getting an uh, urgent message. I apologize. This this is actually a big. Um, okay. Yeah, this is um, uh, a big part of of my experience is that things crash in. And I have to deal with them. So I, I can let that sit for now. Um, so, um, you know, what this has meant is that I've had to grow and develop with the disability as a child, as an adolescent, as a teenager, as a young man. And, and go through all those phases. Um, I walk <coughs> a little bit um, very short distances, you know, here to the car, um, the car to my desk, but uh, I really can't walk far. New York is very hard for me to get around. It's um, a very pedestrian city and the subways are not accessible. And you've either got to have a lot of cab money or um, uh, you got to be able to use the subway. So um, that's just kind of a quick introduction to... Um, did you have more specific questions or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm I just, I guess I'm, it, you know, it, it seems like you lived such a full life and I believe you also have two children. I do. I have two kids. I'm married. Uh, I'm ordained. I uh, went to grad school. 
did those things. Uh, so it's been a full life. It's been a full life. Um, so was there a question there? Yeah, I, I guess I guess I just there was less of a question and more of just wanting to connect with you, um, just because. Well, it, it seems like you know what what you've dealt with. First of all, you've dealt with it much longer your whole life. Um, Fifty and it, years. Yeah, yeah, and it's <laughs> and it's more it's more severe than my situation. You know, I'm able. I'm able to walk and I'm able to do, and I have all upper body strength. My upper body hasn't been affected, yeah. but, um, but yeah, it's just, it's definitely made everything a lot harder and it's made me a lot slower. I've always been a very fast person and it's really made me slow down and, um, yeah, it just made me really kind of connect to my vulnerability and, and, uh, Can't, humanness. Forgive me. Um, yeah. I I want to ask you about a therapy modality. Have you tried uh, Rolfing, R-O-L-F-I-N-G? I've heard of that, but I haven't tried it. It's a, it's a type of massage, right, Rolfing? I mean, that's probably the easiest way to um, explain it. Um, and it's, you know, uh, you, you want to find... Um, somebody who's been in the practice for a, a long time uh, there are always you know people who are learning the art um, but someone who's been working with bodies for um, decades just has um, an embodied sense of knowledge occasionally my body will work itself into situations that are really painful. Um, and I can't take it into the shop every time I feel pain because it would always be in the shop. <laughs> but uh, when I get really locked up, um, I found rolfing to be one of the few mo modalities that actually makes a huge difference. And since some of what we both struggle with is, in fact, neurological. Uh, perhaps it'd be helpful to you. Yeah, that, that I'll definitely look into that. I've actually, I have uh, at one point looked up Rolfing for whatever reason. I, I was just like researching it years ago. Yeah. And there's a lot, I'm, I'm, I'm actually in New York, so there's a lot of uh, practitioners yeah. of yeah. different modalities here. Just try and try and find someone who's been at it for a while. Uh, you want the benefit of the experience, not the bargain rate discount price for someone who is trying to build up a, a practice. For sure, for sure. I mean, I'm I'm lucky that um, I don't really have pain. I, I my hips get really tight. I have a lot of like tightness in my hips, but. Um, I don't have pain other than that, which is, which is, you know, great because if on top of that, having pain is. Based on what you've described, I think it's worth a shot. Uh, you might have to try a few sessions to, for it to take hold. So don't just give it one and done. But um, the, the only downside i would say is that i haven't found an insurance company that covers it so you're probably going to be paying out of um pocket you'll need to get more sponsors for your uh podcast and yeah. then you can uh pay for it out of, out of pocket yeah yeah if if anybody wants to <laughs> donate to uh, my recovery fund, <laughs> that's right. It's it's, a, it's already been costing a lot and a, and a lot of time and a lot of energy and um, and and just you know um, to come full circle in full disclosure, this cough that you've heard me make once or twice is something I picked up in 2020. Um, I didn't get uh, COVID during that season at all. Um, but I developed a cough and, uh, I have not been able to, um, get that thing to go away. And 
Yeah, I'm somebody who talks for a living, <laughs> and I've already got a lot of uh, compromises and limitations, and I don't need that one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, it's it's crazy because I've heard so many stories, and um, you know when this first happened, I was I thought it was long COVID, so I was in like all these groups, and um, like I I know a lot of people that still have issues with their smell uh also um stuff in the throat like like always like having to clear the throat like always feeling like not being sick but feeling like you're about to get sick so yeah. like i've been hearing a lot of these kind of things that seems to have come after uh covid like no came. actually <laughs> that's what killed uh, my father um not so much the covid itself but he um Lost the ability to swallow. After after having it. Yeah, so when you just describe people who always have to clear their throat, yeah, that was a thing. And, um, you know, he was an old man, but he had been in relatively good health. And uh, that thing was nasty, nasty, nasty. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry to hear that. Well, we all we all went went through it. I mean, I think you know, just to come back to the mid midwifery, um, uh, once again, uh, I mentioned that um, as you begin this work for the first time, you might have your own losses and things, and I kind of have to think that. Um, COVID is going to be a part of that. Like, I don't know who you are, whether you're old or young, man or a woman, but everybody lost something significant or you knew someone who, who lost something significant in, in that disease. I mean, um, today... You know, they, they minimize the numbers, whereas at one point they were trying to make a lot out of the numbers. But even if people didn't die, their lives have been changed and not for the better. So, you know, in your case, you know, you probably wouldn't show up on a statistic because you're walking around, you're doing your thing, but your journey became a lot harder. That's not nothing. Yeah, for sure. It's it's definitely been uh, really challenging, and it's so. It's, yeah, I'm sorry. I I guess what I what I was trying to say, and I want you to finish your thought. I apologize. This is a little bit the nature of Zoom. I I didn't mean to cut you off, um, but I think becoming a healer at this point in time means becoming a healer in an age of trauma, an age of loss. We are in a sea of, of loss and, and destruction all around us. Uh, so the need is greater than ever, and your own experience of loss will be greater than, than ever. I'm sorry, what were you going to say? Um, yeah, I, I think the thing that I was going to say is how gr grief is very interesting, you know, because there's a part of me that would just like to like pull the bandaid off and kind of feel everything. And it's just interesting how it comes in waves and it comes and it goes. And I'm like, oh, do I have I accepted it? And I'm like, I think I kind of accepted it, but I haven't fully accepted it. And then I'll just get a wave and it's like, oh, my God. And like, I, I can't do this. I won't be able to do this. And, you know, kind of this whole uh, just the, the way, it, the way grief comes and, you know, I've heard, and I've heard people say before, like, oh, you know, it takes like three months or six months to grieve. And then, you know, I think, I think the other thing that's made it difficult is, I mean, I'm, I'm happy it's this and not like, you know, it's in some cases people lose their legs, right? So they don't have no legs and you lost your legs and you're kind of like, all right, well, those legs are gone. <laughs> I'm not going to grow back limbs. And it's just, my case is so unclear uh, the MRIs are very unclear. Most people didn't see anything on the MRIs. There was only one doctor that kind of confirmed what we've been suspecting it being. 
and yeah, and I'm in general, I'm so I'm so healthy and I have all this energy and I'm like, oh, like if I just keep pushing and keep doing things and it's like there's there's that hope and there's that possibility that I can get better. Or, and that almost like it feels like that kind of prolongs the grief because it doesn't allow me to just kind of say, oh, this is this is it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think it's tricky because um, we don't really understand what happened to you. Um, the jury's still out. We don't know what happened. So without really knowing what happened, it's kind of hard to say it's over. Um, like, look at something like 9-11. That was uh, 3,000 people um, in one day. And... Um, it took us a um, time as a country to grieve that a long time. And I was just one day. I mean, there's a sense in which COVID isn't over <laughs> and we were losing 3000 people a day at the peak of COVID. So like if 9-11 was of that magnitude, this is so much more broad and it has no parameters. It has no beginning and it has no end. So how do you grieve that? So I think that maybe the only thing that you can grieve for sure is certainty. Because we don't actually know what happened to you. But you are changed. How, where's your life going to go from here? Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Trying to embrace that. And I feel like, I feel like um, it has made me more committed to my uh, meditation practice and my inner work practice. And I think that's at the core Right. When I um, when I kind of think about this, how it's impacted me and like the things that I can't do, um, you know, it, it sucks. It sucks having those limitations. But what is in the core of my being? Right. Which is like this transform, yes. which is like this drive for a transformation of consciousness or, or awakening, which is what really drives me at the core. It yeah. hasn't. It hasn't stopped that. If anything, it's just added fuel to that kind of drive. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of how, that's how I made sense of it. COVID can't get between you and your meditation. Yeah. It just becomes an object. <laughs> it becomes an object, you know, and yeah. that's really in, in once, once you go deep enough with meditation, it's like, you know, at first it's, Oh, I need it to be perfect. I need it to be quiet. I need to have my perfect environment. Yeah. And then and then as you keep doing it, eventually it's like, oh, actually, I have to be able to do this with, you know, my kids yelling and like yeah. all this stuff going on and my health issue and all everything is welcome. Let's bring everything into this meditation. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um that is awesome. So what well, you know, there may come a day where we achieve understanding and we might say, okay, you had this um, outcome, which happened in, you know, 3% of people from Euro-American descent who were male between the ages of whatever and whatever, and this is what happened to you. We might get that, uh, or we might not. Uh, and and those are facts. But what you're about, this journey, uh, and this passion that you have, this drive toward consciousness, um, it's just unstoppable. Yeah, thank you, Stephen, for, for seeing that and uh, for mirroring that. And I guess, you know, this is, this has been a really uh, fascinating conversation. We 
really got into spiritual midwifery, dialogue, dialectic, subjectivity, objectivity, um, some of these tools of spiritual midwifery, including irony and, and negation. And, you know, we got to connect on this health and disability and these kind of challenges that, um, you know, I, I've come to realize that everybody goes through it, whether it's even if it's not a, a physical uh, disability like you're facing or what I'm facing everybody's dealing with their own challenges and their own loss and their own grief. And, yeah. um, yeah. and yeah, so I've really enjoyed connecting on all of these pieces and, you know, is there anything you wish I would have asked or anything else you want to share before we kind of wrap up? Um, well, what I would say is that this is a very, very new space for me. Uh, I'm a busy guy. Uh, my life is full, and um, you know a lot of the extra time that people have for hobbies and stuff, uh, I use just to catch up. <laughs> so my, my life is tight. Um, I'd like to add. Um, I've got a new book coming out this year. I don't have a date yet, um, but I would very much like to send you uh, a free copy when, when it does come out because you've been awesome and, and welcoming and supportive. And, um, you know, it, I, I just really feel sincerely thankful for the chance to share um, my life's work. Um, I know that uh, when you were asking me about the chapters, um, like I, I wrote it um, in, in 2000, uh, 24 years ago. And then on top of that, it took another 12 years to find publication. Um, so, uh, it is near and dear to my heart, even if the material seems rusty. Uh, I'm just not inclined to, uh, reread my own stuff. It feels a little, uh, narcissistic to, to do that. Um, but I love the material. I thank you for the chance to share it. I hope that this is the beginning of our conversation. I really enjoyed talking to you, and uh, I hope that you'll approach me about anything. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much, Stephen. And um, wow, like I'm, you wrote this book in uh, 2020, and so you must have been like 24, 25. It's amazing to to work to write something of such depth and integrity. It's it's fascinating that. At such a young age, you were able to um, put something like that together. And um, and yeah, and I'm also curious, maybe you can share the title of your new book and kind of a little bit about what it's about. Yeah. To plug that in. Yeah. Um, so uh, this book that you've shared with your readers is called uh, The Art of Spiritual M Midwifery. And um, when that finished up for me, I wanted to go further back into the history of dialectic and the philosophy of dialectic. I didn't want to do all that philosophical work in um, midwifery because midwifery is its own subject. We're talking about this method of helping people and some of these historical details and footnotes confuse what is already a demanding topic. So um, I went behind spiritual midwifery to write uh, The Art of Wheelchair Maintenance, which is a serious um, uh, homage to Persig's Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I mean, basically, it's my response to his book. And to, to answer your 
pressing question. The um, current book is um, a sequel of sorts to um, The Art of Christianity Christianity and wheelchair maintenance. Um, when I did when I did that book, wheelchair maintenance, I thought you know my story is a little bit different. I'm someone with a medical problem that chose to have a ministry in hospitals. That's a little different, and maybe there's a story there that I can tell. Um, so I tell that story and I write behind the ideas of mid midwifery. And then, um, this new book answers some of the questions, uh, behind that book. So I just kept going deeper and deeper with each book. One of the ways that you and I talked about midwifery today is we talked about the powerful and positive way dialectic can help people out of their stuck, stuckness and move forward. Uh, dialectic also has a very destructive power, power of dualism. And we see that today where um, half the world hates the other half the world <laughs> because they voted for the other guy. That's dualism. And, you know, when I no longer have to listen to you, uh, but because you're in the wrong category, that's dualism. So on the positive side, it's dialectic and dialogos. But on the destructive side, it's dualism and seeing your uh, enemy everywhere. Um, and these are ideas I explore in, in the new book. I talk a lot about my own journey in the new book, uh, both being a disabled person, uh, being a chaplain in ministry. Um, I talk about being an adopted person, which I am. I'm also adopted. Um, and, you know, how all these different things fit together uh, in, in the work that I do. So I can't wait for it to come out. Um, it's a slow process. Um, Meaning, you know, once you send it to the publisher, you're kind of in a queue. And there's nothing I can do to accelerate the queue. I've done my part. They have a backlog of other projects that they have to work through before my project gets to the top of the pile. So um, that's kind of what I'm sitting with and not happily. <laughs> yeah, what, do you have a title? Uh, it's uh, Confessions of a Circuit Rider. So um, it's both a nod to uh, my own Methodist heritage. Circuit riders were a thing in Methodism. And they were people who would go to like three or four different churches. And I really feel like that's what chaplaincy is as you go from room to room. I've met people from all over the world in one hospital corridor. <laughs> like, well, somebody's going to be from South America, somebody's going to be from China, somebody's going to be from Pakistan. And uh, I got to work with all those. I've met people who survived the Holocaust. Uh, I've met some really amazing people. And so... Um, you know, uh, the circuit rider motif kind of fits what I do, and uh, it's more episodic than the um, wheelchair maintenance. The wheelchair maintenance is more of a cohesive story of how a guy in a wheelchair goes into chaplaincy, 
And this is more, here's the chat. There's actually a chapter about midwifery. Here's the chapter about midwifery. Here's the chapter about chaplaincy. Here's the chapter about dualism, um, dialectic. Uh, so I hope we can talk about all this stuff here. A great conversation partner. You've been very generous with your time uh, getting into my work. Uh, you probably one of the few uh, non-chaplains that have, um, you know, spent time with my project, and I'm deeply appreciative. Thanks so much, Stephen. Really appreciate you coming on here, sharing yourself, sharing your vulnerability, your story, um, and, and and doing the work that you're doing. Um, well, thanks. thank you. Yeah, uh, I would love to uh, point to the podcast on my site when when you get it up and I look forward to it. I know you have your own process, so just let me know when it's ready. Yes, absolutely. I will I will let you know when it's live. You are really generous. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, Stephen. All the Bye -bye. best. Take care.